I'm Bill Weil, and I'm delighted to welcome John Kumi here to speak to us today. Um, John uh, used to work, I think, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs for quite a while, and these days he describes himself as a free-range researcher, all organic, no antibiotics. Um, uh, he is an adjunct, uh, or I guess consulting professor at Stanford, um, no salary, no responsibilities, lots of fun, um, also affiliated with, with Berkeley Labs uh, still. Um, and he looks for interesting problems to work on that in many cases people will pay him to work on that hopefully will do some good in the world. And he's going to talk to us today about electricity use and efficiency in servers and data centers. Um, one thing I want to remind people, this is a public talk. Um, it will, um, assuming you sign the, the waiver, um, it will go up on the, uh, on the internet. So make sure you don't ask questions that you wouldn't want out in public. Okay? All right. Thanks. John. Thanks very much, Bill. Can everyone hear me in the back? So I'm going to talk to you today about data centers, but I wanted to put that issue in a larger context. And the context is that of what I regard as the defining challenge of the 21st century, which is that of reducing our carbon and greenhouse gas emissions to 80 or 90 percent below 1990 levels by the middle of this century. Hey, let's, there we go, sorry. Okay, so what can we do about the climate? We know that we have to make these substantial reductions. Uh, Calvin, in this cartoon, has one answer, but unfortunately this is not something within our current technological capabilities, that of leaving for somewhere else. As I see it, we have three options. We can adapt to the climate change that we know is already in the pipeline. We can suffer, accepting what comes, but what comes is likely to be disruptive, difficult, and uh, costly in terms of lives, ecosystem damage, and economic disruption. Or we can mitigate. And so one of the things I would like you to come away from this talk with is an idea that mitigation, which is the third option here, this is reducing emissions, Mitigation is not just about new technology. New technology is part of the picture, but I would argue at least as important is institutional change and also human behavioral change. And so, yes, we need new technology. There's no doubt about that. But we also need to think about how we organize our economic systems, our companies, our, our households, and to change some of the arrangements that we've come to regard as standard practice. And what we've seen historically is that when there's a big crisis, those institutional arrangements are changed. People do actually make those changes. And those changes can happen much more rapidly than new technology, in many cases, can be widely used. And so that's kind of the big picture to all this. Now, I want to use the data center area as a way to frame that discussion and give you some very specific examples of the kinds of institutional problems that get in the way of increased efficiency, that get in the way of reduced emissions, and then talk a bit about how information technology and the kinds of work that you folks do here can help facilitate the institutional changes that I'm talking about. So the name of the game, of course, in solving this problem is innovation. And I mean innovation not just in technology, as I said, but also individual behavior and attitudes. Purchasing of goods and services, purchasing of energy using equipment, and the way we operate energy using equipment. I'm not going to talk much about that in this talk, but obviously households and, and your purchasing behavior has a huge impact on residential uh, emissions. Uh, there's, of course, technological innovation, and then there's institutional innovation. In each of these cases, information technology and network externalities are our most important allies. And if we play our cards right and use information technology in a way that it is most effective uh, to do, uh, we will be able to more rapidly change the institutions that we need to, uh, that we need to, to get to where we need to be. So on the technology side, I'll talk about this briefly. The main concept I'd like you to come away with on technological innovation is that of whole systems, clean slate redesign. 
This is a concept that uh, Amy Lovins in particular has become well known for. And the idea is figure out the task that humans want to accomplish and start from scratch. Don't assume that you have to continue to build things in the way that you always have. Because last time you looked at this, technology was a lot different than it is now. And so clean slate redesign can help you realize immense leaps in the way technology interacts with human beings. So one example is that of the iPhone here. Uh, this was a case where people actually looked carefully at what people actually wanted to do in, in terms of a phone. And they made something that people really want because it does what it, what it needs to do in a very effective way. Another example is that of the Toyota Prius. The basic concept is you want to build technology that's better all the way around so that people want it for more than just efficiency. So the Prius is a, is a great example. This is a very efficient car, but it also is technologically advanced. It's comfortable. It holds five people. It accelerates reasonably well. It has Bluetooth. It has voice recognition. This is a car that was done well. And that's the kind of game-changing innovation we need more of in order to get to where we need to be on emissions. So on the institutional side, there are a number of different ways that you can implement this whole system redesign concept. Back in the, in the early part of the information technology revolution, say early 80s, uh, personal computers had just come into widespread use. And the economists were wondering, well, where is the productivity gain that we would expect from all this uh, investment in computers? And it took until the mid to late 1990s before those productivity gains started to become manifest in the statistics. Why did that happen? Because at first, people put PCs in the old institutions. They didn't change anything about the institution. They just put PCs on people's desks. And that doesn't lead to game-changing innovation. What leads to that, uh, this kind of innovation is when you redesign the institution, to use the, the attributes of the new technology more effectively. And we saw this also when electric motors were introduced in the late 1800s. The same sort of thing happened. People designing factories had originally been using water wheels and some steam engines and some other more difficult to use uh, technologies for power. And suddenly with the electric motor, they found they could redistribute the process of doing manufacturing in a way that was effective for increased production, as opposed to being constrained by the power source that they had. So again, but it took several decades before that sort of innovation uh, trickled through. On the business process side, there are many different ways that you can improve the way institutions uh, use resources. Uh, one of the examples I like is that of uh, the Six Sigma program, DuPont. Uh, uses this particular program. I visited there a few years ago, and they use this, this particular program as a way to identify opportunities within the company. They have a group of uh, analysts who are not attached to one particular business unit. Instead, they go into the individual business units, and they evaluate what's going on in that business unit for opportunities. And they are assessed on whether their initial analysis was correct and whether when they implement the opportunity, they actually get the savings that they had, uh, had postulated. And when I asked my friend about this, who's in DuPont, he said, I, I asked him specifically, are you going to run out of opportunities? After you do this for a few years, are you going to figure out uh, you know, that you've got it all? He said, no. Every time something changes, technology, price, the way the institution is organized, new opportunities come up. And so this is, a, this is a, another example of a game-changing innovation that can have real uh, substantial impact on the efficiency of companies, the resource use of companies. It's important, of course, that you measure the results and that you reward good results when they come about. It's also important to rethink some of the underlying assumptions. So the batteries in this remote control device, back in the old days, even a couple decades ago, the job of the manufacturer of batteries was to produce batteries. That was it. But nowadays, people are starting to think about extended producer responsibility. So now, battery manufacturers, in, in many cases, have to think about who's using their batteries and how can we get those batteries back to be responsibly recycled. That's a change in the way people conceive of 
in, other, in essence, property rights. And that kind of a change can lead to radical changes in the incentives for companies and radical changes in the behavior of companies. And then last here, uh, there are various ways to foster and reward innovation within companies. And one great example, there's a company called Wright Solutions, which is in uh, Rhode Island. And there's a, there's a great Harvard Business School case study on this. They developed an internal marketplace for innovation. And in that marketplace, any person in the company could propose an idea. Each person in the company was given $10,000 or $20,000 of funny money. Each person could propose an idea. Once the idea was vetted, that idea goes up as a stock in this internal marketplace. And if other people in the company think it's a good idea, they can take their funny money and apply it to the ideas that they think are best. And that allowed the best ideas to percolate up to the management. So the management could say, ah, OK, these three really, people, everyone thinks this is a great idea. We better do this. And it wasn't just about cost savings. It was also about new products and helping existing customers. So again, this is a, an institutional innovation that can lead to game-changing innovation within companies when uh, widely applied. So one of the lessons, I think, of the last 20 or 30 years is that environmentalists and business must get past uh, the adversarial relationship that sometimes exists. And uh, one way to do that is to start uh, thinking about information, giving, giving consumers information about the behavior of companies so that consumers can identify products and companies that, that are doing things the way they think they ought to be done. People need to be able to make decisions based on accurate information. So uh, one example, scorecard.org, uh, originally started by Environmental Defense. It's a website that uses publicly available EPA data to uh, identify polluters in given geographic areas. So you can type in your zip code, and it will tell you who are the polluters, what are they emitting, based on the, the latest EPA statistics, and then it will allow you, with the click of a mouse, to uh, fax the operator of the plant saying you don't like what they're doing. So that's one example of how uh, information technology can help in this way. Another is that of the Carbon Disclosure Project, part of the Clinton Global Initiative. And that effort is intended to get companies to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions to investors and to consumers. There's also information about uh, products that's important to release. So Energy Star is one familiar example where the best products in terms of environmental performance and energy use and cost are identified with a single label so that consumers don't have to go through the process of doing the analysis themselves. It's important to create both internal and external pressure for continuous improvement and reorganization. And that internal pressure comes from the desire for cost savings within the firm. The external pressure might come from consumers saying, we want this kind of behavior and not this other kind. Another important lesson is that the supply chain is critical. And you can use the power of the supply chain to advance environmental goals. So one example is uh, supplier responsibility. We talked about batteries. Another is to use purchasing power to move the market. So as a thought experiment, what if Walmart were to say, we're only going to sell Energy Star labeled appliances from now on? What would happen? is not only would there be an increase in the sales of these appliances leading to economies of scale, because you're producing more of them, the products that used to be niche products with high markups would then become products that are commonly used, and the markups would be lower. So the companies selling them would still make profits, but they would be making profits on products that are considered to be the standard product instead of the advanced product, and so or the niche product. And so that, those two effects actually be, can be quite powerful in reducing the cost. So um, one example that I like to cite is that of uh, organic food. I, I decided to do a little uh, field trip, and I looked at Berkeley Bowl to see, well, of course, they have organic bananas. We knew that. How much did they cost? These, at Berkeley Bowl, they have uh, bananas from Dole, 79 cents a pound. So Dole, clearly a large company, has moved into this area. I went to Trader Joe's. They also had Dole bananas, a little more expensive because they sell them per piece. And then I went to Safeway. They also had organic bananas, same price as Berkeley Bowl. Uh, these were Bonita. But the point is that large companies had decided that organic was something that they wanted to go into. And this is true for other products as well. 
Now, one of the issues that comes up is what does organic mean? Right? This is always labeling is a really critical thing. When you look at the, the bananas, they have this, this nice seal on them. It says certified organic central union certifications. Okay? And so this is something that comes up again and again. Consumers, when they're making decisions, they don't have time to do calculations about which product is the most energy efficient or will cost the least. It's important to give them relatively simple decision rules so that they can make good decisions easily without large transaction costs. In order for this kind of label to exist, there needs to be a government activity or there needs to be some sort of industry collaboration to come to agreement on what means organic. You can't, if you want, to, if you want success on a large scale, if you want your 80% carbon reductions, if you want to have large scale environmental improvements, you can't just have hippies eating organic bananas. Everyone has to eat the organic bananas. So let's turn to data centers. There's been a lot of confusion over the years about this. I started working on information technology, electricity use back in the 90s. And uh, around about the year 2000, there are a couple of guys running around talking about how the internet used 8% of all electricity use and all computers used 13% and the total was going to grow to half of all electricity use in 10 years. This turned out to be bunk. And I spent about two years of my professional life uh, proving that it was bunk. But uh, out of that work grew the first peer-reviewed work on data center electricity use. And that's something that I and uh, Jennifer Mitchell Jackson at the at University of California, Berkeley, and Michelle Blazek at AT&T worked on. Uh, and that started a set of measurements that uh, continue to this day at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, the goal here is to review some of the recent data so, you can, so we can talk about the trends that we see, discuss some of the implications for industry growth, and then I'm going to move into uh, talking more about the institutional issues that impede the data center industry from improving their efficiency. So let's be clear here. Uh, I'm talking generally about the data center industry as a whole. There are different markets and Google obviously has one specific set of uh, data center activities that they use, that their data centers are optimized for, right? But there's a whole world out there of many different applications, many different data centers. And I'm talking in the aggregate about that whole world. We can talk specifically about uh, some of the issues that might come up in your work later. So there's a lot of recent activity, a lot of uh, new facilities being built. Often you see these announcements, they don't give relevant details, like how much electrically active floor area is there how many servers are there likely to be, and so on. So you have to be a little careful in interpreting those announcements. We know that because of latency and, and other issues, you can't build all these data centers in one area, uh, so they're likely to be spread around the country. Um, we know that these are different markets. The hosting market is different from the search market, is different from the corporate market, is different from the high-performance computing or supercomputer market. So when thinking about this, uh, this area, you have to separate those. There's a lot of different equipment in the data center. Most people think of the information technology equipment here, computers, computer racks, say. But there's also power distribution units. There's uh, uninterruptible power supplies, which have batteries to keep the uh, computers running long enough to, to have the generator kick in if there's an outage. There's also, uh, well, these are the backup generators. There's also lights. There's office space. And then there's the cooling and uh, condition, air conditioning activities here. So there's a lot more going on in the data center than just the computing. But this is what people tend to focus on. Now these are the, the standard uh, sort of servers that uh, people buy off the shelf. Of course, uh, you guys are doing custom servers for your search data centers. But uh, they can range from these, these very large uh, high-end boxes to uh, 1U and 2U servers. Each U is about this thick. It's like a shape of a pizza box. A one U server is about this big. And uh, those tend to be the volume servers. And it turns out those tend to use the most electricity in the aggregate. There's also, of course, there's storage, the disk drives. There's also uh, networking equipment that uses electricity as well. So one of the other lessons of uh, years of working in this area is anytime you see a watts per square foot number related to data centers, watch out. People are generally very careless about defining what the watts are as well as what the square footage is. And so this is an example from 
uh, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. It's a forecast, history and forecast of their uh, estimated heat load per product footprint. So this is watts per equipment square foot. So for a rack, it's about six square feet. So they're taking the total power use of this rack of servers, dividing by six square feet, and that's what this number means. And you see numbers you know, here, 100, 200, 400, uh, 1,000. You know, by 2004, 2005, we're looking at 6,000 watts per square foot. Well, that's true per product footprint, but that doesn't tell you anything about how these things are actually used in real facilities. And so if you really want to have a sense for what's going on in real facilities, you have to be much more careful about the way that you uh, express floor area. So the Uptime Institute is a user group. Uh, it's a group of data centers who come together to share information in a, in a confidential way. And in this case, uh, I was able to convince them to release some of their data on watts per square foot. When I'm talking about watts per square foot, I'm talking about information technology load, so the computers, the servers, the disk drives, the networking equipment, and the, the square footage is what we call the electrically active floor area, also often called the raised floor area, although not all data centers have raised floors. But it's, it's basically the computer space, the place where the computers are. It's not talking about the floor area of the, where the heating, cooling, uh, and fans occupy. This is just about the computer space. And uptime, they've tracked over the last eight years, they've tracked data centers, uh, 19 data centers, and the total uh, represents about uh, a little under 1 million square feet in 99. And so I'm going to show you the, the graph of those data. This is plotted as an index. So 1999 equals 1.0. And we've got three things plotted here. One is the index of total power, which is this dark one. One is the index of floor area. And one is the index of watts per square foot. So on the floor area side, you see something interesting happening here is that in these 19 facilities, you have a decline in the floor area. So there's some consolidation happening after, uh, during and after the tech bust. and then. Around 2002, you started to see some uptick just a little bit in terms of how much area was being devoted to data centers in these, uh, in these specific facilities. You also, on the watts per square foot side, the index goes up about 35 40% over this uh, the seven, eight year period. And it goes from about 23 watts a square foot to 35 watts a square foot. So those numbers are very different from the ones I showed you earlier. And these are real facilities Lots of times uh, people, because of constraints in air conditioning or power, they will spread the servers out over larger areas and make it, you know, in other words, use the existing facility in a way that can hold some of the newer equipment. But in order to hold the newer equipment, which is denser in power use, you have to spread it out more. So there is definitely growth, though, in these existing facilities. There's no doubt about it. They've definitely been putting more equipment, more powerful equipment in these facilities. So that's, those are specific facilities. What about the aggregate? One of the things that I wanted to know uh, in the last couple of years was how is total data center power use growing? And I managed to convince uh, AMD to fund research on that specific question. And uh, it's downloadable here. All major industry players reviewed it, including Bill, uh, including Intel, including all the server manufacturers. And so this research was vetted pretty thoroughly. And uh, it used uh, data from IDC, which is probably the most widely used source for data on the server market. And uh, fortunately, AMD paid the, uh, the cost using their own contract for uh, the data from, from IDC. The goal was to estimate historical data. So we looked at year 2000, year 2005. We looked at volume servers, which are the most common ones, those, those 1U and 2U pizza box servers that I talked about, the mid-range servers, uh, and then the high-end servers. Uh, it looked at the US and the world. And for each of the, to estimate the power use for the different segments, I actually looked at the most popular models of each computer type and used either measured data or uh, engineering estimates to get the, uh, the power use for those. And this is the summary of the results. Here we have the US. Here we have the world. On this axis is total electricity use in billion kilowatt hours per year. 
for context, the US electricity use is on the order of 3,500 billion kilowatt hours per year in 2005. And so I've broken it up. This is electricity use. I've broken it up for the year 2000 and 2005 into volume servers, mid-range, high-end servers, and then the cooling and auxiliary equipment. So that's the losses in the power distribution system. So one thing you see immediately is that a big chunk of this electricity use is the cooling and auxiliary equipment. Typically, for every watt of server power, there's another watt devoted to the cooling or associated with losses in the power distribution. Another thing to take from this is that this is the growth here is mainly a story of volume servers. You don't see much change in the absolute amounts here for high-end servers and mid-range servers. So that's, that's also very important. And then in the aggregate, we're seeing over this five-year period about a doubling. So pretty substantial growth. The average annual growth is something on the order of 16% per year. Um, Bill. Just looking at this, eyeballing it, it looks like the percentage of high-end mid-range, high-end and mid-range servers is higher in the rest of the world than the U.S. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, I think. Well, that part of that is an optical illusion because this, these bars are higher, but sure. I think that's probably true uh, in the aggregate as well. Interesting. Yeah, uh, you do see there is definitely a reduction in the number of mid-range servers. That is, oh, from the, over this period, a pretty substantial reduction in the installed base of mid-range servers. High-end servers stay about constant in terms of their absolute numbers. So there's about a doubling here, 16% per year annual growth. Most of the growth is volume servers. So that's one of the key lessons from these results. So this is follow-on work that's going to be uh, released officially in the next week or so. Uh, same data set, but I wanted to break the, the data down regionally so you could get a sense for this. The U.S. is still a dominant market. This is 2000, in 2005. Still the dominant market here with uh, roughly 35% market share. Western Europe is second. Together, those two areas comprise about two-thirds of total electricity used by servers. You have Asia Pacific, excluding Japan here, at 13%. The rest of the world, I think, at about 12, and Japan at a little more than 10 so, uh, so certainly the, the developed countries plus Japan are the dominant current use, but what we see is in terms of average annual growth rates over that period, 2000, 2005, the Asia Pacific region, excluding Japan, is the only one growing significantly faster than the world average. So roughly 23%, I think, annual average growth rates. And somewhat lower growth here in the US and Japan these are about average here. So there was a report to Congress on data centers released in August of this year. It built on that AMD analysis that I described, also downloadable. Uh, purpose was to give a sense for the total electricity use, but also to identify barriers and opportunities for both government and, and business. This is a summary of that. And the, the, data, the server numbers are about the same as what I had in the earlier study. The important point to take from this is that this includes both the storage and the networking equipment. And again, still the story is volume servers are driving the growth. Storage and networking does increase, no doubt, but it's a much smaller percentage of the pie than the, than the servers and particularly the mid-range servers. So there are a lot of trends pushing the total data center power use up. and you guys are uh, at the heart of uh, some of these demands here. There's demands for e-commerce, voice over IP, search, uh, software as a service, video downloads, uh, resilience in the face of disaster. So sometimes you have to have mirrored data centers in case something happens. Uh, there's also regulatory compliance issues that lead to increased use for data storage and electricity use. And then, of course, there's demand for the kind of transformation that IT enables, Ch big changes in the way business operates. You also have general trends that are uh, putting more transistors on a chip, more RAM and servers, and more volume servers. Those also drive electricity use. One of the, the uh, terms that uh, Ken Brill at Uptime likes to use is the, uh, the number of watts of server electricity per $1,000 of spending on IT hardware. And because of these trends, the watts per $1,000 of I, uh, IT expenditures uh, 
these, these trends have been going up. And that means that in data centers, the uh, auxiliary equipment and cooling costs as a fraction of the total cost are increasing very substantially. And we'll see in a second what that implies. So on the, on the downside, of course, you've got uh, trends towards virtualization, consolidation, better management of data center operations. You've got constraints in power and cooling, uh, particularly in areas like New York City. Uh, you have a recognition by uh, the C-level folks in the company, the CEO, the CTO, the CIO, that they're going to need to address some of these inefficiencies that exist within many data centers uh, from a, simply from a cost perspective. You also have uh, metrics that are now coming in. The spec power group, as well as the EPA and the DOE, are working in this area to help people get a metric for continuous improvement of either server power or operational uh, efficiency of data centers. And then there's some rebates in the utility area. Throughout the data center, there are misplaced incentives. So one of the big problems is that energy efficiency metrics are not standardized. And so different companies use different measures of their efficiency. Some don't even measure it. But those that do don't have a standardized way and can't compare to uh, how they're doing compared to other firms. 90% of the costs related to cooling and infrastructure are actually kilowatt related, not square foot related. But almost always, either internally or externally, data centers are charged per square foot. So if you want to put in servers into a data center, they'll give you a per square foot cost. This is changing slowly. But again, if you're not paying for the true cost of what your, what your actions are, you're likely to act in a way that's going to be less efficient than, than otherwise. Very often, the utility bills and the infrastructure costs are in two separate departments. So the IT department has no incentive to spend an additional dollar on an efficient server, even though it would save $5 on the infrastructure side. You also have differences of hierarchy and culture within organizations. And so facilities folks, IT folks, and the, the finance folks don't talk enough. They don't talk well. They, don't, they use the same words to describe different concepts and uh, different, con different words to describe the same concept. Um, part of what's going on in the data center is humans have a limited ability to manage complexity. And so what they do in the face of complexity is they establish rules of thumb that provide safety margins so that they're not going to, the data center's not going to go down, they're not going to get fired, and so on. So people will often, they'll take the rated power of the computer, which is typically two or three times the actual power use, and then they'll double it when they're sizing the power conditioning equipment or the cooling. And so that, of course, leads to great inefficiencies in the uh, uh, building and operation of these facilities. So in order to understand what's going on in terms of incentives here, I wanted to, to look at the total costs. And I did this model with funding from IBM through Uptime to look at the, uh, the various costs in a, in a data center that's uh, high performance computing for financial applications. So it would be for one of the financial houses in New York who are doing derivatives modeling and analysis of the markets and looked at all the different components of the cost. And for this particular kind of facility, this represents typical industry practice. And this is the end result there. Site infrastructure costs, in other words, the cost of the cooling equipment, the cost of the power conditioning equipment, the cost of the distribution of power, turns out to be about 2 thirds of the capital cost of the IT. So you think, when you think of a data center, you think of IT. Right? You think of computers. But when you're building a data center, Something like two-thirds of the capital cost is actually associated, and this is on an annualized basis, so it deals with the lifetimes of the equipment. Something like two-thirds of the annualized cost is actually site infrastructure. And because the watts per thousand dollars of computing equipment has been going up, that means that this term is continuing to grow. And in some cases, it's already equal to or surpassed the IT costs in a data center. So that's one of the reasons why the C-level is paying attention now. It used to be these facilities cost in the tens of millions. Now they cost in the hundreds of millions. And that's a level of expenditure that gets the attention of the CEO. Because they need to think, well, we're spending $300 million. Is there some way we can do something about that? And because of all these inefficiencies in the way the organization works and the way information flows, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for improving the efficiency. So, on the efficiency side, whole system redesign is, again, the name of the game. 
making sure the incentives are aligned towards minimizing total cost of ownership is critical. So you have to make sure that within the organization, there's one budget for the data center. And the people making decisions all have to be in the room at the same time, the facilities, the IT, the real estate folks, and the financial folks. Uh, the easy stuff within data centers, you can change some of the infrastructure operations. You can start charging for power, for example. Typically, in, when, you, when people move data centers, they find 10 to 30% of the servers are sitting there using electricity, not doing anything. People were afraid to turn them off. So again, this comes to the difficulty of managing complexity. If you had a comprehensive inventory of all the servers in your data center, what they're doing, what software they're running, and so on, then you would be able to tell that pretty quickly. But in many data centers, that's not the case. Now, in many of the servers that you see, the high-end stuff, the, ser the power supplies are pretty good. But for the lower-end servers, uh, the power supply efficiencies are certainly in the 80%, maybe lower range. And we know that we can build power supplies that are close to 90% efficient. Why doesn't that happen? Because the people designing the servers say, oh no, we're competing on first cost. And we can't spend that additional $20 or $30 on the power supply, even though it'll save 100 bucks on the infrastructure cost. And the trick is, how do you change the incentive so that people are not competing on first cost? Because really, at the end of the day, the customers have to start demanding that they're, they're, we're, we'd love to pay you $30 for the power supply. That's an opportunity for you guys. And they need to, the manufacturers need to get outside that. There's other things related to metrics. Uh, switching over to DC power is a whole uh, another kettle of fish, which has potential benefits and some costs as well. And then there's a the whole virtualization area. So I wanted to show you one example. It's not quite whole system redesign because we only did this over the course of uh, maybe six months. I sat down next to Lori Weigel at the meeting where I also sat next to Bill. It was a DOE meeting in December of 2006. And I said, I, as soon as I learned that Lori was head of server marketing, I said, here's something you guys could do that could make a real difference. And the idea was take all the efficiency technology, build two racks, build a standard rack that looked like good current practice, and then build another rack. They called it an eco rack because they're good at marketing, right? Uh, and the idea was to put as much efficiency technology as they could into that second rack, have a meter showing the power used by both of them to make it very simple. You mean I could buy this rack instead of this rack and it would save me this much money? Thank you very much. I'll take this one. And the, they got to about 16 to 18% savings compared to good current practice. And that's the good current practice include 90% efficient power supplies. They're working on a couple of iterations of this. This is a summary of the, of the results. Here's power use per rack kilowatts measured as UPS input. This is the standard rack in idle mode, so it's not doing anything. Standard rack in full utilization mode. And the eco rack saves between 1.5 and, and 2 kilowatts, so 16 to 18% in those two cases. One source of savings came from adding a better processor. Another source came in moving to high density uh, DIMMs. So if you have one gigabyte DIMMs and you switch to two gigabyte DIMMs, turns out there's a fixed power cost for each DIMM. So if you go to two gigabyte DIMMs, most people don't know this. It's, it's very odd. I hear a lot of people, when I say this, they're like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, and then they also uh, use DC power on this one. And that Intel has been working very hard on the DC power concepts. Part of the savings from that comes from at the plug. Part of it comes in the infrastructure. Um, even if you stuck to AC power, of course, there's a lot of opportunities. So let me just summarize, because I think we want to leave enough time for questions here. For servers, the total power use is about 1.2% of US electricity use. So it doesn't sound like much, but it's basically doubled over the last uh, the five-year period, 2000, 2005. If you include storage and networking, gets you up to about 1.5% of electricity use. It's likely, you know, if the IDC numbers on installed base for servers holds, you're still going to see some increases over the next five years of between 40 and 76% uh, or so. Within existing facilities, watts per square foot appear to be going up. So people are putting more servers in existing facilities and uh, packing them more densely. 
Volume servers are the name of the game here. They're driving the growth, and that's where the power use is. Within this area, there are perverse incentives all over the place. And that's exactly where these kind of institutional changes can make a huge difference. Once you align incentives, then people within the company start feeling empowered to uh, reduce total cost of ownership instead of minimizing hassle or keeping the boss happy. And at the end, the name of the game is minimizing total cost of ownership, increasing profits. You want alignment between individuals in the organization and the organization's goals. The need for organizational change in this sector is driven mainly by the fact that infrastructure costs as a fraction of total costs in the data center have been going up very rapidly and will continue as, uh, based on the best current data. We know that uh, met having metrics is really critical. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So uh, the SPEC Power Group is working on metrics for servers. EPA and DOE are working on metrics for the infrastructure side. And there are a lot of changes happening now because the manufacturers are realizing that their customers are having problems and they need to help those customers solve those problems. So I want to end again with this really important point. In order to solve the climate problem, we need new technology for sure. But we also need to make changes in the way our institutions are organized and the way people behave. And if we do that, we will be able to, to make much more substantial reductions than if we just focus on technical fixes. We know that even currently available technologies that are cost effective and beneficial are not being adopted. So that in itself is proof that we need these kind of institutional and personal changes. And we also know that information technology, as embodied by the work that uh, folks at Google are doing, is key to achieving and, and capturing these, these kind of changes. So with that, I'd like to turn it out to questions. I've exhausted you all. There has to be one question among you. We can also take questions from the uh, folks at the remote sites or video conference. Hi, you said that the EcoRack had a savings of about 16 to 18%. What was the cost of getting those up front? Well, the, the Intel folks estimated there was roughly comparable cost. And they were removing part of the thing that part of what happens when you go to DC power is that you actually use fewer components. So there was, a, there was actually a cost savings there. But they didn't do a full detailed engineering analysis. We're hoping that for the, the next version, that we will actually get costing from uh, some of the big OEMs so that we can, we can lay it out really clearly. But since, this, since basically they had six months to do it, they had their hands full just building it. So I'll ask a question. Oh, good. Um, so if, if I were the CEO of some random company, which thank God I'm not, thank God for me and for the company. <laughs> um, You've retired from that sort of activity. Um, what would your advice be in terms of key institutional change that the CEO that I should try to push in my company to actually really make a difference around this? I think the most important thing is to assign one person responsibility for the overall financial performance of data centers. And usually that person is the CFO, the, the chief financial officer. And that person, you should have the the facilities people and the IT people and whatever financial folks are related to this decision all plugged into one person so that when there's a decision to be made, all those people are in the room and the, you know, the facilities folks can raise their hand and say, oh, no, we can't have that generator for six months because there's backlogs. Or you know, the IT folks can say, you know, we can't spend this additional $10. And some other folks can say, well, the whole system cost says, yes, you can. Uh, but you need to have everyone in the room, and there needs to be one person responsible for the total cost. And if you do that, I think you'll see some big changes very rapidly in how the facilities are designed and operated. Any other questions? I feel like I'm on some talk show. It may be unrelated to your talk, but what are the trends in the use of renewable energy for powering data centers? 
for powering data centers. Yeah, renewable energy for powering data centers. Ah. Do you know about the trends? Well, I know that there are some facilities that have put solar on the roof, but the energy densities of these mm -hmm. is, are much, much higher than typical facilities. Uh, I know also some have started to use geo exchange mm -hmm. so that you, you use the ground source heat pump for you know, accessing some of the heat in the ground. But I would say we're only at the beginning of that evolution. I, I don't have a whole lot of examples for you, but I know that people are starting to think about it. Thank you. I have a question for Kirkland. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, um, different uh, power usages at idle versus not idle. Have you seen any research um, with regards to basically shutting off some of the machines on day setter and using stuff like that? Yeah, there, there are actually some companies that are starting to experiment with this specific thing. And so it's not just, when you do virtualization, you're combining uh, different instances of the operating system on one box. But some have started, as long as they have the right equipment in the data center, some have started actually to shut off servers that are not being used. Now that takes some very sophisticated software to do the predictions and understand the trends in the loads and so on. But because there's so much inefficiency in the way these things are designed and operated, there's a great potential for money savings from that. And the key impediment has been fear about reliability. And once there are a few, you know, a few more demonstrated examples like this, high profile examples, then you'll start to see people making the kind of investments and changes that are needed at that level. But it's not trivial to do, but it's definitely, given current technology and current understanding, we know we can do it because I, I was just visiting a company that was doing it this morning. So I know that it's, it's starting to happen, but it takes a fair amount of investment to start with, and then it takes the sophistication of people who have been doing this stuff for a long time to make it really work, and then to satisfy the people who are fanatic about reliability as they should be within the data center. Any other questions? Can't you guys kind of go in sequence, you know, so I could <laughs> optimize my, you know, people seeks here? So okay. the uh, um, how much of the, of a problem is it the way the electric rates are structured? Like the you know, if you're a big consumer of electricity, you get your marginal cost per kilowatt hour is peanuts compared to to residential users, for example. Well, one of the reasons why the electricity costs are much cheaper is because it's much cheaper to serve these customers because they're so big, and so half typically half of the cost of your residential bill is actually the distribution network. So all those, the wires outside your house, that is something that a big data center typically doesn't have to deal with. And so the costs are actually a lot lower. My sense is that even, that's not the main thing driving this. The, the main issue is that internally it's very hard to coordinate how people make decisions and how they operate the facilities. And because these are such big users, they're going to get lower rates just because their costs are lower for the utility. Hey, John. Hello. Um, what can What's you, you share with us about what uh, future plans the EPA has in store for us as far as data centers go? OK, well, what I know is that uh, Andrew Fanara, who works in the labeling branch at EPA, has been working on uh, specification, an Energy Star specification, a label for servers. So specifically on the equipment side. Uh, there's another group at EPA that's working with the Department of Energy on the facilities side. Uh, my understanding from Andrew, I mean, they started accepting comments and going to different, uh, different venues around the country to, to get feedback from different industry groups. They were just at the Uptime Institute meeting in Santa Fe. Uh, and the schedule, is, as, as far as I understand it, is sometime in 2008 they hope to have some sort of energy star specification for servers. But I think that's uh, undetermined exactly how that's going to work. But, but Andrew wants to do it. And as long as there's a way to do it that balances the, the needs of industry to have the full choice of servers that they need and also give the information so that customers can make sensible choices, then I think he's going to go forward. And part of this will be related to the spec power work that's coming out in the next month or so. So there, that, that'll be a basis 
for measurements of power use of specific servers that the EPA can then use credibly to, to analyze what different uh, efficiency levels could work. On the infrastructure side, I think they're not quite as far along there. So I wouldn't expect anything too soon, but in the next year or two, probably. Anything else? Uh, other questions? All right. Thank you very much, John. We Thanks appreciate to it. all of you.